Hi, I'm Paul Feinberg, host of UCLA Anderson's podcast. I'm here today with Professor David Lewin. We'll be discussing uh, labor costs, labor reduction in the current recession. David, we're in a recession, and people are concerned about losing their jobs, about being laid off. Um, a lot of companies are laying people off. I know you have a, a different take on, on that issue, and you uh, wrote, so in, wrote that in the Wall Street Journal. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about uh, what your alternatives to layoffs are and, and your thinking in that area? Sure. Uh, the main alternative is to cut pay rather than jobs, or to cut compensation rather than jobs. There's only two ways of which I'm aware to achieve a reduction in labor cost or payroll cost. One of those is to cut the jobs and the people holding them, and the other is to cut the pay and benefit rates <coughs> of people holding the jobs, but not to cut the jobs and therefore not to cut the workforce. In general, there are always particular circumstances in situations, but in general, I favor the cutting pay rather than cutting jobs approach. I do so for a few reasons. One, knowing that you can get to the same labor cost objective by preserving the jobs as opposed to cutting them, I favor the pay cuts for that reason, uh, one. Two, when the economy recovers, <clears throat> and while forecasters differ about the depth of this recession and a turnaround date, we've always recovered from prior recessions, including the Great Depression of the 1930s, so there will be a time when we recover. When we do, if you've preserved your human capital, you are in a better position to respond to increases in customer demand for products or services. You're in a better position to provide good service on products and services. You have a group that is much more likely to be highly motivated to perform because you preserve their jobs during a recession. And from my both micro and macro uh, level perspective, Saving the jobs reduces the unemployment insurance payments that states have to make to their residents who have been laid off, and the stabilization of the workforce reduces the amount of the payroll tax that a firm has to pay. This is determined state by state. So I think there are uh, several reasons uh, to advocate what I have been advocating, uh, which is cutting uh, compensation rather than jobs. I should add that I'm well aware of the possible risks of cutting compensation. Two of those, uh, it is claimed at least, are uh, you'll lose key talent, one, and two, you'll demotivate people. I think by definition in a severe recession, where is the key talent going to go? They can go somewhere, but their opportunity set is far less than it would be in an expansion. And if somebody leaves your business the first time you have a recession situation, Maybe you can replace them with somebody who isn't so inclined. Uh, I think the motivational effects of keeping the job during a recession will outweigh any demotivation effects of having your pay reduced. Finally, I'm not advocating pay reductions into perpetuity. If you find that after three months or six months or eight months, not only haven't things improved, maybe the recession's worsened, you're financial situation as a company has worsened, you can then always undertake layoffs. You're not foreclosing yourself from following the layoff approach by doing a compensation reduction approach initially. I do think you do foreclose the compensation reduction by doing layoffs initially. Do you, do you think that companies have to be uh, concerned that the market for whatever it is they're doing or selling will be the same post-recession as it is uh, pre-recession? Are there just industries or companies that are going to be forced to make such a transition that it just doesn't make sense to maintain uh, the same size workforce they had before? Right. Um, I'm sure that there can be some instances of that. However, I think that that was what we saw in response to the 1980s recessions. We had one at the start and one at the end of that decade. I think that's what we saw in the early 90s recession. Financial service firms in particular were ones that decided never to rehire in the quantities they did before. They were looking for lower labor costs per revenue of dollar generated and a higher revenue per employee. Lots of other businesses made the same kinds of decisions. Uh, others found technology substitutes for certain kinds of labor. 
But, you know, we're in an economy where virtually every industry is competitive, very different from the old days when we had lots of oligopolies and monopolies. So I don't think that there is a lot of slack in the system, which is why, to connect up the answer to this question with the answer to your prior question, cutting the workforce in this time means you may be cutting some of that muscle, some of that real blood and guts you need to respond well when the economy recovers. I think virtually every industry I know has undergone some kind of uh, competitive shakeup over the last uh, half a decade, decade, or two decades, from autos and chemicals uh, to software and hardware to most areas of medicine. Uh, maybe the only era, uh, sector that's kind of escaped uh, these competitive pressures um, is higher education, although I think one can make an argument that there's now a global market in higher education, whereas before we tended to see more U.S. dominance. So I don't have... Uh, much over concern for industries that would have a fundamentally different future once a recovery comes into play. Can you give us an example of a company, maybe one we know, that has successfully employed the uh, pay reduction as opposed to, to layoffs? Sure, I'll give you a few examples. Uh, <clears throat> Southwest has a long history of this. As a matter of fact, one of the things among many that makes Southwest notable, well, the most notable is it's actually turned a profit every year since the mid-70s in an industry where nobody makes a profit. But uh, immediately following the combination of the uh, bursting of the tech bubble in the early part of this decade, not the more recent real estate bubble, and post 9-11, the average reductions in workforce among aerospace companies and airline companies in that first six months following 9-11 was 26%. Southwest didn't lay off a person. They cut compensation, they cut benefits, people forgo, for, <laughs> people uh, did not get bonuses, people did not get profit shares, they didn't do any more stock contributions, so they were able to reduce the labor costs in this way. And interestingly enough, you can see many other examples of labor cost reduction in the earlier, less severe recession of this decade uh, following the tech uh, bubble bursting. So 201, 2 in the early part of 203, Bonus plans, which had been paying off handsomely in the prior years, say 96 to 201, didn't pay off at all. Profit sharing plans didn't pay off at all. And stock ownership, whether obtained through a discounted purchase plan or a grant or an option, those were underwater. So this meant that companies saved money on payments that would otherwise have been made. They didn't have to cut the workforce. So all of those companies would be, an example, would be examples of ones that in an earlier decade didn't use the workforce reduction approach because they were able to reduce compensation. They just didn't call it a reduction in compensation, but analytically it means the same thing. In the current recession, FedEx is another good example of a company that's had pay cuts starting at the top and carrying down through mid-management levels and first-line management levels. Uh, most recently, I think they've extended this to employees. The last time I uh, talked with uh, colleagues at UPS, they had gone to the pay freeze, benefit reduction, and upper management pay cuts. Hadn't yet gone to pay cuts for deliverers and other personnel like that, but were about to embark on them. Harman Kardon has done the same thing. SAS has done the same thing. Uh, Cisco's done some of this. Um, so you find a number of examples, new ones that actually come to the fore every day. Caterpillar's done some of this. Is it important that these uh, payroll reductions start at the top before they roll down to the workforce because the people at the top just make more money? Or is there a psychological uh, reason for that as well? Well, I, I think there is a, a very important symbolic and thus psychological impact of doing that. See, executives who claim that they're a strong culture organization, everybody shares the same norms, values, beliefs, and expectations. Well, the test of a strong culture isn't in an economic expansion, it's in an economic recession. This is one other reason why I argue for preserving the jobs while still reducing labor costs. And I think reductions, the example should be set at the top. Not particularly because of an argument in many quarters that top execs are overpaid. That, that's a different issue. But it is to show that what you're asking people in your strong culture organization to do, which is to bite a bullet, to take a pay cut or a benefit cut or both, it's going to start with you, and it's going to start with your top management team, and it's going to trickle down, uh, if you like. And I think that is the proper way to do it, even though the sheer volume of people employed at upper levels versus employed at middle and lower levels is much smaller, and thus the total labor cost saving is much smaller than it would be in the middle at the bottom. The symbolic uh, psychological importance of that, I think, can't be overstated. 
Why do you think it's um, taken uh, so long for this to become uh, more common? You just listed a number of companies. <coughs> it actually just seems easier to just cut, cut pay than it is to try to figure out who you're going to get. <coughs> well, if, for example, in the basic managerial economics course we teach here at the Anderson School, uh, prices adjust in markets, and sometimes prices come down, you have demand reductions or supply expansions. When it comes to the labor market, however, we spent a long time in the middle and latter part of the 20th century kind of getting used to pay only rising but never being cut. Some people call this uh, wage stickiness on the downside. For a while, it was popular to attribute this to labor unions. <coughs> You can't do that anymore because in the private sector of the United States, labor unionization is 7.5% of the workforce. Some of this was also due to monopoly and oligopoly. If you had the customers by the short hairs, which is what those terms mean, you could pass on any cost increase in the form of a price increase. Labor cost increase, materials cost increase, and so forth. With the onset of so much competition in every industry, the idea that wages don't only go up, has now set in. And with this particular severe recession, I think recognition of it has become much more widespread. David, when I heard you speak recently, you discussed something you, you called the dual theory. Could you uh, talk about that a bit, please? I can, and I'm also uh, pitching this as another idea to the uh, Wall Street Journal, although I have a prior one in the queue, so this is idea three. And actually, um, I, I might take it a step further and call it the triple theory of human resources, and business performance. So in brief, here's what it's about. Organizations typically have a, what I call a, co a group of core employees. <clears throat> They're salaried, they work full time, they have benefit coverage, they have training and development opportunities, promotion possibilities, career paths. They often work in teams, they often have a lot of decision making responsibility. Their pay ha has a substantial variable at risk component. <clears throat> and uh, a lot of information is shared with them. Those employees are the ones that I believe it is proper to think of as managing them as assets, or in the parlance in my field of human resource management, high involvement management. <coughs> Around that core, if you think of kind of a diagram or a dartboard, is a next ring. That's the second ring, and here comes the duality. I label that group peripheral. These are people who are leased or rented through outsourcing or people on fixed duration contracts, four months, 11 months, 15 months to get a task or a project done. People working part-time, people working temporarily, some people who've been moved from the company to one of its suppliers. That group is peripheral uh, in, in, this, uh, in this categorization scheme, and they are managed by low involvement practices. <clears throat> For a fixed price, they're not carefully selected, they tend to have high transiency, high turnover, not much investment in training and development. They are not career path types. They're not promotion possibilities. The way that they're managed, the objective is labor expense control. So you have the core group that you want to manage as an asset, and you actually ought to calculate a rate of return on the expenditure. And ideally, if our accounting uh, principles were modern ones, we could capitalize and amortize those expenditures. Then you have the periphery, whom you manage for labor expense control. A Microsoft has about a 70% core, a 30% periphery. A C's Candy's got a majority periphery and a minority core. <clears throat> Businesses differ in these respects. Economy-wide, uh, about two-thirds of people work in core jobs and the other third in peripheral jobs. So that's the dual theory of human resources and business performance. The business performance part comes in because if you have optimal combinations of these two types, you can enhance return on invested capital, revenue growth, even market share. But I'm working on a third ring, which makes this a triple theory, and that is unpaid customer labor. So if you think about it, today, if you or I want to track a package we put into the system of UPS or DHL or FedEx, we do it online. But previously, FedEx employed people to answer our phone calls and do the package tracking and the rest of the things. There's a virtual one-to-one -one labor cost a reduction uh, for each customer who tracks a package in one of these delivery companies. Or if you uh, have your hotel reservation in advance, which most business travelers do and a lot of other people too, you can check out without seeing a person. So you have in hotels fewer people that have to be hired to check you out. You can in 
most instances now order your breakfast through the television instead of hanging a door outside your, hanging a card outside your door that somebody has to pick up at 2 a.m. and you have to employ them to do it. Hilton Hotels has been experimenting with turning the keyboard around when you check in and you just check yourself in at the desk because you've got your advance reservation, your signature's on file, you have your reservation number, do what the clerk did, type it in, out comes the key and up you go to your room. That's a very good thing because the turnover rate on an annual basis for the desk clerk job in a mid-range hotel chain is about 350%. <clears throat> Today on airline ticket purchases, about 80 to 85 percent are all done by customers on the net. A majority of customers download their boarding passes. This reduces the demand for reservations agents, sales agents, and all the rest. When you can reduce labor costs this way, <clears throat> you wind up increasing demand for your products or services so that later on you employ people doing other things, which is why this isn't just a uh, customer for labor substitution uh, uh, strategy, but has long-term positive consequences. So draw that third ring. Now this is customer labor. It's unpaid. It's the ultimate in labor expense control. Some of the interesting unanswered questions, because this is pretty new, are can you manage those unpaid customers and is that part of more uh, um, general customer relationship management? Uh, what happens when you run into a problem with a customer performing something that a formerly paid employee would do? But those questions can be addressed. So this is in short uh, the dual going to the triple theory of human resources and business performance. You mentioned that um, you were working on a follow-up uh, for on your Wall Street Journal piece on, on labor cost reduction. Tell us a little bit about what's next. Right, uh, we've discussed the first one briefly that was published, and this third one, which I've pitched <clears throat> to them. But I have a second one that they've asked me to blow up into a full-blown piece. The cut pay, not jobs article, the January 29th, the 209 article was prospective. If I were a company, here is what I recommend the company do, or here is what I do if I were running the company. The second piece is retrospective, and it's the clawback argument. During, in particular, the period of 2005, 6, 7, and early 2008, the big recovery period from the early 2000s recession, I think we know that lots of people made lots of money <clears throat> Selling products and services, which led to inflated financial statements, uh, and in some cases, phony financial statements. The obvious candidates are subprime mortgage lenders, but there are many others. <clears throat> and if I'm a shareholder in a company, I take the risk in that company. If a salesperson got a commission they didn't deserve, that happens a lot, I expect that commission to come back. If an investment banker got money for doing a deal that wasn't merited, I expect that money to come back. If people got payments on the basis of fictitious gains from placing mortgages or insurance policies, that money should come back. And in fact, I think there's a proprietary right to those monies uh, <clears throat> by the shareholders. And if we have to, in the US system, use shareholder suits to do it, then I think we should do it. This moral suasion in the current AIG case is an interesting example, but it's a, it's a little nit on a pin. It's 165 million bucks. I think this is much broader and much deeper uh, and affects a great proportion of uh, financial service firms, a number of management consulting firms, a number of accounting firms. I think we need not to be simply forgiving about this because this is a violation of really some basic principles of business management organization, not to mention fiduciary relationships. So that's what that piece is going to be about. A little tougher issue than the first one, I think.